Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to your meetup and uh, uh, having me talk about uh, the man in the middle of my heart attack. Uh, so the introduction uh, uh, to that, the first talk today was really interesting and I think gave a really good overview of the field. So my talk is more deep diving into one of the topics that Anna covered, which is the medical uh, devices that are implanted into uh, patients' bodies. So I'm a security researcher, but I'm also a patient. Every single beat of my heart is generated by a medical device, a pacemaker that is implanted in my body. Um, a little bit more than 10 years ago, I woke up lying on the floor. It turned out I had fallen because my heart had taken a break, a pulse long enough to cause unconsciousness. So to keep my pulse up, to stop my heart from taking pulses, I needed a pacemaker. Pacemaker monitors each heartbeat and it sends a small electrical signal directly to my heart via an electrode to keep it beating. But how can I trust my heart when it's running on proprietary code and there is no transparency? So when I got the pacemaker, it was an emergency procedure. I needed the device to stay alive. So there really was no option to not have the implant. It was, however, time to ask questions. And to the surprise of my doctors, I began asking questions about the potential security vulnerabilities in the software running on the pacemaker and the possibilities of hacking this life-critical device. The answers were unsatisfying. Um, my healthcare providers could not answer my technical questions about computer security, and many of them hadn't even thought about the fact that this computer inside of me is running on code. And there was very little technical information available from the manufacturer of the implant. So this is why I decided to seek out this information myself. So I started the pacemaker hacking project. Um, this is a bit more than, yeah, I guess six years ago now. Um, and over these last, last years, I've learned more about the security that is keeping me alive. I discovered that many of my fears that I had about the state of medical device cybersecurity were true. I learned that the proprietary software, which I suspected, uh, it was not based on open standards. It's not based on any standard that was scrutinized by academics and researchers. So the so-called security by obscurity approach that is often hiding bad or completely missing security and privacy implementation when you look closer. And I also learned that the legacy technology that is in many of these devices, coupled with the added on connectivity, equals an increase in attack surface and therefore increased risk for cybersecurity issues that may impact patient safety. So I started this project basically because I couldn't find the information I was searching for as a patient and as a security researcher. I was already working in, in cybersecurity when I suddenly needed to get this uh, device uh, implanted. Um, so at the, at the time, uh, back in 2011, when I got my device, there was very little research done on cybersecurity of medical devices and implants. There was only one paper published that I found uh, written by uh, a group of, uh, of researchers led by Dr. Kevin Fu at the University of Michigan in the US. And this was about uh, hacking uh, a, a pacemaker uh, by hacking into the programming device or hacking into the uh, communication with the programming device uh, that uh, sets the uh, different settings of the pacemaker. There was no uh, research uh, back then um, on the internet connectivity, uh, the IoT part of, of medical devices. So I was thinking about this for years and then I changed jobs back in 2015. and started working uh, at a research institute. Before that, I worked for the Norwegian government uh, with the incident response. Uh, so I started work working for this research institute and uh, I was talking to other uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, professionals about my concerns. And uh, I was actually invited to give a talk about this, a keynote talk at a hacking conference. And that was when uh, this, uh, this uh, project uh, uh, formed uh, and started uh, as a very low budget, uh, actually a hobby project in the start. Uh, after a while, I managed to secure some funding. 
Uh, but it's basically been driven forward by uh, master students that I've been supervising uh, in my role as an associate uh, professor at uh, the Norwegian Technical University. And here you can see uh, two of the master students that uh, graduated doing research on the, on the pacemaker hacking project. In the foreground is Anders and uh, uh, then is Evin. And then in the background there is Aaron Leverett, who is also a, a co-supervisor. Uh, so far, six really brilliant students have been uh, been working on this project, and we have managed to find vulnerabilities and uh, and also publish uh, some of the results. So I'll try uh, my best uh, in this uh, short half an hour to go through some of the uh, some of our findings. Uh, but first, I want to tell a story. Uh, a bit personal story about something that happened to me. So I had the pacemaker installed back in 2011. It's been working far, fine. There was a little bit of uh, initial problems with getting all the configurations, all the settings right. But after that, it worked perfectly fine and I could just live my life as before and, and basically do anything I wanted. Um, until it failed on me. Uh, this was back in 2016. So I had already started the pacemaker hacking project. And one of the things that was the, like the, one of my dreams about this project was to actually get access to the data that was stored on my device because there's no way of getting access to this. It's like, it's a black box. Uh, you, you, you cannot find, uh, there's no like openness about the accessing those patient data. And um, so, a freak incident happened that led to me uh, actually getting hold of, uh, of data from my heart. Um, what happened was uh, I was on my way to give a talk at a conference in the Netherlands. And I was uh, flying there from Norway. And I was actually uh, sitting in the airplane uh, up in the air uh, when something happened to my device. It's very strange because usually... Uh, even though every single heartbeat is generated by my pacemaker, I cannot feel it. I cannot feel that the device is pacing my heart all the time. Uh, however, while I was sitting in that airplane, suddenly I could feel it. It was a really strange sensation. I could feel that there was something going on uh, with, with my heart. Uh, and I looked down on my chest and I could see that my chest muscle was actually twitching, contracting in the rhythm of my heart involuntarily. And this is really scary. I had no idea what was going on. Um, I thought that it was something wrong with the, the so there's this, uh, the pacemaker box itself is implanted directly under the skin in this area. And then there's two wires that go through a vein and uh, to the inside of my heart. And then they're attached to the uh, heart chamber walls. And so I thought there must be something wrong with this wire. Uh, maybe this wire has broken a little bit and it's touching the muscle or something. I, I had no idea what was going on. So I just uh, informed uh, 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 the cabin uh, crew, uh, uh, the person that uh, I have a pacemaker. It's something wrong with my pace pacemaker. I don't know what's going on. And he came back after talking to the pilot and said, uh, we're very close to landing at Schiphol Airport. If not, we would have done an emergency uh, redirection of the flight and then an emergency landing. But uh, that was luckily we didn't have to do that. So we landed at, uh, at Schiphol and there was an ambulance there um, waiting for me. That took me directly to hospital. And this is me the morning after uh, in the hospital bed. And I'm looking actually pretty uh, happy in this picture. The reason for that was that after being monitored over the night, uh, waiting for the pacemaker technicians uh, to come in in the morning and check my pacemaker, I just was informed I don't need a surgery. It's nothing physically wrong with my pacemaker. It's something that can be fixed with a software uh, update or a, 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 a firmware uh, reinstallation. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, in front of me, if you look at, uh, a bit closer at this picture, you can see the, there's a trolley with four different devices. These are the pacemaker programmers. And the reason there's four different ones is that uh, there's no interoperability between pacemaker communication uh, for, from different vendors. So we need to have the correct pacemaker programmer to communicate with the device to, to, to look into the settings and, and to uh, interrogate the device. Luckily, they had a bio, biotronic programmer, which is the, the manufacturer of my device. So they were able to check my device. Um, so jumping ahead a little bit, what actually had happened was that while I was sitting in the airplane, 
my device and me uh, was hit by cosmic radiation, which is a little bit more off up in the higher atmosphere. And uh, that had caused disturbances to the electronics of my device. This actually caused bit flips in the memory of my pacemaker. And I had no idea about that uh, at this point. Uh, I wasn't informed uh, formed about that uh, or learned about that possibility until later. But actually, it's something that is described in literature. It's a very rare event, but it happened to me. Um, so I got in the hospital in the morning. The pacemaker technician came in, uh, started interrogating my device, which is done via wireless communication with the pacemaker. And this is his look when he looks down at the programmer and sees something he's never seen before, which is this error message. It says, uh, possible data error in pacemaker. Device is currently running a backup program. And then there's like information about how the device is, is running. And it also says, to resume normal pacemaker function, select memory dump plus reinitialize button to send the standard program to the pacemaker. This will take several minutes. So uh, this is really interesting. So there was actually a crash file created uh, on my pacemaker when this happened. And there was a memory dump taken. And this was all packed into a zip file, uh, which uh, was then stored on the pacemaker programmer. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that on the backside of these programmer devices, there are USB ports. So you can easily plug in a, a USB device if you want to. Uh, I also failed to mention that uh, sometimes these pacemaker programmers are left unattended. Uh, for instance, it was also left uh, alone with me in the room. <laughs> But anyway, I had a USB um, memory stick in my bag and I handed it over to the pacemaker technician and I said, uh, this, this uh, uh, crash uh, file, this log file um, is uh, data from my heart. It's my patient data. Could I please have a copy of that file? And I was super excited, of course, to look at this because this was my first chance uh, even after starting the pacemaker hacking project uh, a year before, uh, to actually get access to the pacemaker data in my own pacemaker. Of course, I haven't been messing with my own pacemaker in this research. Uh, we have had uh, got hold of uh, uh, devices on eBay and also got donations of devices to do the hacking on. Uh, and yes, he, he, he agreed to do that. Uh, and I had this uh, zip file uh, on my USB stick and I was so uh, excited to open it and see what was inside. And so it turned out that this uh, zip file was encrypted. So it wasn't easy. I couldn't just uh, open it and read the, the, the content, which I guess, which I, my first reaction was, this is a good thing. Um, this means that uh, uh, there's some protection, uh, data protection, my, my patient data. And this file was also uh, sent over to the manufacturer uh, so that they could uh, do an analysis of what had went wrong with my pacemaker. <laughs> and so I was in touch with the manufacturer later on in this process and actually got a copy of their report after they'd done the analysis. And that's when I learned about this uh, uh, this uh, bit flips in the memory of, of the device. Uh, and also to, just to end that story, um, after uh, I got the uh, firmware reset uh, on my device, uh, it was back to factory settings and uh, we needed to reprogram it. And there's like almost a hundred different uh, configuration settings that you, that you have to input to the pacemaker to make it work for you in particular. Uh, but luckily, I'm a little bit difficult patient. Every time I go in for a checkup, I ask for a copy. Um, actually, I printed out copy of all the settings on my device. So I had that printout laying in a drawer back in my office in Norway. So I called a colleague and I had him scan it for me and send it an email so that we could get all my settings. Because when we tried calling the hospital to get this information, it was impossible to get through to, to talk to anyone at my local hospital in Norway. So luckily, I had those, uh, had that information available, and uh, the pacemaker technician could just input all of the settings, and I was good to go. Uh, there were some jokes about uh, 
had uh, if I had come to, pe- to do a penetration test uh, of the hospital environment or something like that, <laughs> because some of the doctors actually, or one of the doctors actually recognized me uh, because he was from Norway. And he had found a YouTube video of me talking about pacemaker hacking and shown it at the morning meeting <laughs> in the hospital that day. <laughs> so that was funny. But anyway, I, I, I was good to go. My pacemaker was back to normal again after had a, having that reset. And I could go and give my presentation at the conference the next day. So that was a good ending. And I could also walk away with this zip file. And also at the time I was uh, working with uh, with Avin and Anders uh, on uh, uh, formulating some research hypothesis for their master thesis work. And this was a brilliant opportunity because I actually had a used version uh, uh, that we had acquired on eBay of this pacemaker programmer, which you can see on this uh, this photo. That's, uh, that this is how it looks like. It looks like a really rugged uh, kind of old fashioned computer. Uh, so we had this in the lab, and now we also had the zip file. So I took the zip file to uh, to uh, mass, uh, to the two master students, and uh, I, we, together we come up with a, with an idea of them trying to figure out how the zip file was created, how the data was protected uh, in uh, in, the, in this pacemaker programmer. So what they did was actually in, uh, to do some. Uh, uh, some reverse engineering uh, of this uh, pacemaker programmer to find the little piece of code that created uh, this zip file. But first, let me just give you an overview of the pacemaker hacking project and all the different devices that I'm talking about here. So we have um, we have this pacemaker, which is inside of the patient, uh, like myself. Uh, it has two wireless communication interfaces in, in my... Um, in my case, so it has this wireless communication inf- interface with the programmer uh, that I just mentioned, which is used to set all the configuration settings of the device. But it also has a wireless communication uh, interface uh, uh, sort of indirectly via the internet. So you have to have a device called the Home Monitoring Unit or HMU in this, uh, in this uh, illustration, uh, which uh, can have different form factors. Uh, some of them looks a little bit like an old-fashioned router or access point that you typically have in your in your home. Uh, some of them look more like a mo- uh, mobile phone, uh, and the newest ones actually use Bluetooth and an app on your smartphone to retrieve data from the pacemaker, send it over the uh, uh, operator uh, uh, the uh, the internet uh, back to the vendor's uh, servers. And then there's also a web interface where the doctor can log on and see the patient information and get status updates from the pacemaker. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot of different uh, ways of uh, hacking or uh, lots of different uh, points here you can do the hacking. Uh, when it comes to the programmer, we, we focus on the physical access uh, to the pacemaker since we had this one in the lab. Uh, when it comes to the home monitoring unit, uh, which was uh, also a different uh, uh, student project, uh, um, uh, uh, which Guillaume and Anniken uh, worked on, um, uh, we looked both at physical access, but also a network-based attack. So I'll try to briefly walk you through these uh, different attacks now. Uh, so first of all, this hacker with a, uh, with, a, with a hoodie is not actually an evil hacker. It's me and uh, uh, the students that were working on the project. So this is me, Evan and Anders, uh, which worked on the programmer uh, part of the project. Uh, uh, we had the pacemaker programmer uh, physical um, uh, in the lab. We're able to actually open this up, take out the hard drive, and uh, copy the hard drive. Uh, with no, the hard drive was not uh, encrypted or anything like that. Uh, it was easy. And then uh, Evan understood a great job of actually making a virtual machine of the device so they didn't have to directly work with the device itself and all the fears of breaking it and everything. Uh, managed to extract all of the different software components, uh, including the operating system, which turned out to be Windows XP embedded, so really old and outdated. And there was a lot of third-party software on this too that was all, also had a bunch of, uh, of vulnerabilities. Uh, and 
And then there was the file that we got from my incident up in the air. <laughs> and then uh, Evan Anders did a brilliant job uh, on actually doing the reverse engineering, finding uh, that piece of software that created um, created uh, the file. And uh, uh, so first of all, if we found a third party software library, uh, which was called Shilcat, which uh, is a, a software to which is used to create encrypted uh, zip files, which was great because then, then you have to narrow down uh, or what to narrow down on. The problem was that it was very hard to find uh, a working or to find a very outdated version of this library uh, in order for them to, to actually write some scripts uh, to communicate with it. Uh, uh, but they managed to find some references by searching on the internet and do some kind of... Uh, uh, software archaeology, <laughs> that we called it, uh, to find this really old version that was uh, actually used in, in the programmer. Um, and they found uh, a, a DLL file, uh, which actually was the file that, uh, that is like looking for a needle in the haystack, but they found the needle in the haystack and they found the, the software uh, that actually created uh, the, uh, the encrypted uh, file with my data. It turned out uh, the encryption use was AES, which is standard and good. Uh, problem, however, was the key that was used or the password that was used to encrypt. It turned out it was hard coded and it was biotronic in big letters. So that's not very impressive, right? So it's the same password everywhere, which means that uh, even Anders were able to create a script that could decrypt my file of data, but also any other patient's data created by any other programmer. So this is just an example of the problem with hard-coded passwords, which Aina also um, mentioned earlier. So this was one project. Um, I'll come back to it and the vulnerability disclosure process um, uh, related to this. But let me move on to the home monitoring unit and the internet connectivity part. So here is me. Uh, I like taking uh, <laughs> awkward selfies <laughs> with students. <laughs> so this is me, Guillaume and Anniken, who worked on, uh, on uh, the, uh, the, the research I'm going to present now uh, with the home monitoring unit. Um, so they worked uh, also uh, partly together uh, in the lab uh, in Norway. And they were focusing on this home monitoring unit, which uh, you can see a, a photo of here. So this is one of the different versions of the home monitoring devices that we had available uh, for the hacking. And this is the one that looks a bit like a, a modem or access internet access point. And it basically is a, 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 a 2G uh, modem. Uh, so when you open up uh, the device and look inside, uh, you can see the antenna here. I'm sorry, the picture is a bit small, uh, but uh, we were able to um, easily um, uh, find out uh, what were the different components were. And um, the hardware hacking was not very was was kind of easy in this case. They were exposed uh, uh, debug ports, uh, both UART and 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 JTAG that we could uh, attach to, and we could actually. Uh, um, listening to the communication between the microcontroller and the modem. Uh, and some of these also contained uh, SIM cards uh, that were still working. Uh, so our research showed that the, the credentials uh, that the, the home monitoring unit uses for logging on to the backend infrastructure, they are sent in clear text using AT commands, which is kind of old fashioned. Uh, but this is something you can typically see in very old internet connection modems. Um, also, the, uh, this uh, home monitoring unit does not perform mutual authentication, which means it's actually possible to do a man in the middle attack. And one way of doing this is to connect it to a fake base station. And this is also something that uh, Anniken and Guillaume did. So Anniken's... Um, uh, biggest contribution in this was uh, was the fake base station set up in the lab and intercepting uh, the uh, the communication. 
And then Guillaume did a lot of uh, uh, research on uh, actually extracting, uh, also doing some physical uh, access uh, hardware hacking by uh, attaching to the to the JTAG uh, using the JTAG later uh, device, as you can see here, and uh, and uh, dumping the memory of the device and actually getting access to the encryption keys that were used. And then he also did really great some really great job on uh, on um, uh, actually uh, reconstructing the communication protocol uh, the proprietary communication protocol that was uh, was used by this device and he found out that data is actually encrypted which is good the problem however are the available encryption algorithms that are in use so turns out there's three options deaths which is really old and outdated, triple DES and AES. And, and we could see that the, uh, that the SMS data was actually uh, encrypted by DES in some cases, which is uh, not very impressive. Um, so it's possible with physical access to, to extract encryption keys. And then it's also possible um, to uh, to perform the man in middle attack just by network uh, based uh, attack um, uh, by using this fake base station. So this is the man in the middle of my heart attack scenario. Uh, so how can this be exploited? You might you might ask. Uh, because uh, the pacemaker is actually not programmed, you cannot change the settings of the pacemaker through this home monitoring unit. It's just extracting information from the pacemaker. Uh, but one uh, way of doing this is to actually uh, look at the, the, the messages that are being sent, the data that's being sent from the pacemaker. It could be critical for patient safety because in some cases um, this has actually happened with a lot of devices they have had the physical uh, fault with the battery which means that the battery drains much faster than it's supposed to and in that case uh, uh, the pacemaker will send a low battery alert through this communication channel and if you uh, as the man in the middle hacker uh, know replacing this with an evil one because of course we wouldn't do this in the lab or we wouldn't do this in in the wild uh, I mean, if you're a VIP or attractive, uh, somehow interesting target, this might be a relevant uh, threat scenario for you. Uh, then the attacker can change this to battery OK, and it wouldn't be detected uh, and responded to, which, of course, can create harm, uh, potential harm to a patient. So we had these findings, uh, both from the programmer research and also from the home monitoring research. And we wanted to disclose this uh, to, the, to the vendor. And we wanted to do this through a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process because we want to ensure that these vulnerabilities are addressed. We want, them, we want to do this to minimize risks and to also provide users sufficient information to evaluate the risks. We don't want to keep this hidden, but uh, we also want to give the uh, vendor enough time to respond uh, to the vulnerability findings. So we actually put uh, the maltreaties under embargo for one year while we carried out this process. So just very quickly, there's uh, different roles in the, that are defined for coordinated vulnerability disclosure that we were uh, adhering to. And we were in the finder reporter uh, role uh, we decided to use a coordinator, uh, the vendor uh, of the uh, pacemaker that we had done research on was Biotronic, which is a German company. Uh, so we decided to uh, do this through the German uh, regulator authority. So we contacted the BSI in Germany and also the B-Farm, which is uh, the FDA of, uh, of Germany. And we used BSI as coordinator and we delivered the report to the vendor through, through them. And we also involved uh, CISA uh, and the, uh, the, the former ICS cert in the US uh, and the FDA to uh, also uh, submit our findings. Uh, but this wasn't a very easy, straightforward process uh, because Biotronic did not have a product cert. They did not have a bug bounty program uh, or published vulnerability disclosure program. Uh, they did actually not have any published information of how to securely send vulnerabilities reports to them. 
So I had to uh, actually, when I first got in contact with them, they sent me to a PR person. Uh, but eventually we found the right uh, person to, to, to be in contact with. And, and we did that through these coordinators. So I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm, I'm, as again, I'm running out of time here. Uh, but the, the result was like a, a bunch of, uh, of meetings, calls. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the result was actually for the first uh, uh, vulnerability report that we submitted, which was about this hard-coded password in the pacemaker programmers. Uh, the outcome was uh, that uh, they did not accept this as vulnerabilities because they did not uh, represent an uncontrolled risk as defined by FDA. Uh, so the outcome was that we actually went ahead after one year and uh, published these findings at the DEF CON Biohacking Village. So um, everything is uh, available and, and published from our side, uh, but the vendor decided not to address these vulnerabilities. Uh, but then the second uh, Report which was, which in my opinion was much more, um, let's say, critical for the patient. Uh, we uh, also went into a bunch of different uh, calls back and forth uh, with the second report. And in this case, eventually, after a year, uh, we got the uh, uh, vulnerabilities published as CVEs. So you can find all the information, all the details about this. There's a blog tech very good technical blog post that Guillaume has written. Uh, I've also written a blog post about this and we uh, published an academic paper uh, just a few weeks ago at the, the International Conference on Biomedical Electronics and Devices. And you can also see the uh, resulting CISA advisory there. So I think I want to stop there and uh, say that, uh, well, I uh, also want to mention uh, that I'm working with I Am The Cavalry, which is a group of volunteers that are uh, really um, focused on where computer security intersects with public safety and human life. And uh, actually, uh, back in 2016, I think it was, we published something we call the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices. And we've done a lot of awareness raising around this topic. So if you want the details about this, I would want to uh, refer you to iamthecavalry.org slash oath website. But these are some guidelines, uh, ways of having a um, security posture uh, when it comes to creating medical devices. But yeah, I want to end with saying that, uh, of course, having the pacemaker, for me, the benefit outweighs the risks. I'm not afraid of getting hacked. I actually feel empowered by having this uh, knowledge now about the security of my own device and also insecurities of my own device. Uh, and I managed to finish running a marathon uh, running with the device. So this is me uh, finishing uh, the New York uh, marathon back in uh, 2018. Uh, I'm really happy there. I'm really proud of myself for being able to do that. Uh, so thank you.